Woodlawn, Tennessee, a beautiful location. There's a gardener here. There's a, a new garden. And what she has done and created here is a painter's palette. Rebecca Britt, you're the gardener that had a plan. And you have a history, I know that. So tell us, when you started this, what was the end result that you were hoping for? Well, um, and when I started this in 2015, there was, was nothing here. Um, a and blank slate. A blank slate, tabula rasa. And I knew that I'm, I'm a, just a collector of plants, always have been, but I didn't want it to look messy. And so I started just sketching out a design that had some symmetry, some formality to it, so it wouldn't just look like chaos. And so I started with just the circular bed here. Yes with four paths radiating out. It would be paths that would be easy to get to. I could get to any part of my garden at any time. I could push a wheelbarrow do, through it without any trouble. I started with this, this circle um, right here and, uh, and then forming the, the four paths that go out from it. They radiate, don't they? Right, they radiate out from it, just like the sun. And um, I chose this this little gem magnolia to put in the in the middle because it's going to be green year round and it's not going to get enormous. Exactly. <laughs> it's going to stay small. It'll have the fragrance and the evergreen. Yes. So I keep this this middle bed um, kind of uh, minimal, and in the springtime there's there's a lot of daffodils and oh, tulips yes. that I that I encircle it with. So in the summertime I keep it. It relatively bare with the St. John wort. I see that. Um, yes, the, so there's, you know, in the, the Lyrope. And um, then just kind of filled in everything outside of that. And it's, it's just a, a garden that has a lot of room for expansion um, whenever I need to. And, um, and so you, you chose the limestone gravel. Was there a reason for that for your paths? <laughs> I have been very fickle with the, the pathways and a lot of trial and error. I've had um, started with brown gravel, decided I didn't uh, like that. Even even used kitty litter at one time, which gave a nice little <sighs> soft crunch. Um, and then this year just kind of filled in with some more, uh, I just like the gray better than the brown. It I just gives like a little bit too. more contrast. So you left the kitty litter under there. It's under there, plenty, lots and lots of kitty litter. Let's mm -hmm. choose a path and go down it because you've got many wonderful plants in here and I, w I want us to show as many as we can. Sure, okay. Tell us about some plants in here. Back there, that is the zinnias? Zinnias, yes. Um, those are the zinnias, the cleome, and the celosia. They're all volunteers, uh, volunteer yes. annuals that yeah. just kind of reseed themselves every year. Um, the zinnias, I, I specifically uh, pick the dwarf or Lilliputian varieties because I found that the traditional zinnias get so tall, oh, yeah. they, they kind of overshadow everything else. Yes. Uh, and they fall over. So I just prefer the dwarf variety of the zinnias. And this lovely Cleome is going to emit some fragrances sooner or later when you brush against it. And then this Celosia right here. That, I love that burgundy color and all of this, and I love this purple plant right the pin here. The pincushion flower. I love that. Yes. It's such a bright, fresh color. I like to make flower bouquets, so a lot of my choices in the garden are flowers that I can incorporate into bouquets to give to others. Yes, and let's say its next door neighbor is such a complimentary, that that cone flower right yes. there. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a couple of different cone flowers throughout the garden. So again, uh, pollinators of course are something that I look for. We have um, 60 acres here that are in specifically uh, conservation uh, wow. reserve program for pollinators. So just like to attract the butterflies and bees. Now, which butterfly prefers that orange plant over there? Oh goodness, which one doesn't? <laughs> the swallowtails, of course, um, love them. Uh, later in the summer, early fall, the monarchs will come through. Yes. This, this orange butterfly weed, um, along with a lot of milkweed, is naturally occurring back here on the farm uh, in the field. So 
I thought, well, um, well sure. let's, let's it's include your land. it in the garden. <laughs> let's include it in the garden and bring I some agree. of those um, butterflies and bees here. Okay, and I noticed that you also have some lambs here and it has a particular purpose for you, doesn't it? Well, the lambs here, of course, is, is drought tolerant. It can take the heat. Uh, it's a nice ground cover. A lot of people will uh, remove the stalks um, to encourage the leaf growth, but I've noticed how much the bees love the flowers on the stalk, so I intentionally leave them. This naturally caught my eye, hmm. an agapanthus. So where did you get one that's hardy for us? Um, I don't know. I, I found it at um, one of our, our many uh, Mennonite-run nurseries yes. in the area. That's where I, I get a lot of um, my plants because they are, are very healthy. Yes, they uh, are. Homegrown plants. Yeah. And then I see something I missed. I missed that you have strawberries. <laughs> yes. This was so much rain. This was not um, the best strawberry spring. Um, but yes, I have a raised bed over here and this one over here of strawberries. Uh, again, through trial and error, I learned not to put them right into the ground because they will quickly take over, spread and take over the garden. So right. I keep them confined to raised beds. My ear is bringing me to a turning point, but I love your fountain. And there's a couple There's a of frog in there. <laughs> oh, a frog in there? He's swimming around in there right now. Oh, he's just chilling. Yeah. Now, and the rocks you've surrounded this with are locally harvested, aren't they? Oh, of course. Uh, we have a couple of creeks and springs that run through our property. So every single rock you see in this garden, I um, specifically picked and, and brought back. I just, whenever I'm down there at the creek, I look for rocks that are uh, either fossils you or just good You sure you're not rocks. my child? <laughs> okay. I'm a rock collector Me for too. sure. Now then, right here, this of course is a crepe myrtle. Yes. You've got something interesting winding its way. Tell us about oh, yes. this. Uh, that is a native clematis. You can see some of the um, uh, kind of bell-shaped flowers. Oh, they don't right hear. Yes, some of the yeah. blooms are on there. In there. Uh-huh. I'd always been told you can't just take a miniature rose and stick it in your garden and expect it to live. So um, challenge accepted. Yes. <laughs> and it has been here for several years now and is very happy. And has never really tried to grow bigger, has it? No, it has stayed small. It is truly a miniature. Yes. Okay. I see some bright eyes right here. What is this? It is just a multicolored daisy. It isn't that pretty. It is. I like daisies. And so I just so noticed this one was unique. It not is. Not your tradi traditional Shasta or Montauk. And so I the just foliage decided it, is also interesting. It the, is. The ferny like, I like it that. It is, it looks different. What would you call this rose? This is a petite knockout. Um, of course, you can see that it is between blooms right now. But exactly. one thing I love about it and makes it unique from all the other knockouts is even when the blooms are finished, they stay on there and then they keep a firm grasp on those stems. And as the color fades, they're just, they still kind of retain some, some interest. Beauty, and you know what? I second that. Now I do have the one behind it, the sunny. Uh, the yellow the, one? Yes, the sunny yellow knockout because I love the smell. It's the one yes. knockout that actually has a scent and it's a beautiful lemon um, kind of scent. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Okay, I note that you do have quite a bit of lavender. Now you are successfully growing that here? Uh, yeah, it, well, it depends on, on which types, you know, you purchase. Uh, yes. You have to look for some that are gonna be cold hardy. For our typical winters, this is a Spanish lavender and it, it does well. It, it's much more cold hardy yeah. than maybe the French lavender. Well, and you know, you do have a mulch here that does help you in preserving them over the winter. This yes. pine straw mulch is yes. very good to give it some extra protection in here. All right, uh, on further up here, I see that you have a beautiful Althea bush. It is blue. The big purple there. Yes. That is blue chiffon. Did not love all of the rain that we got this spring. Uh, you know, it likes the dry heat. Yes. 
Well, right under its beautiful blue chiffon bloom, I have a plant that I love, your agastache. Yes. Agastache, I just, um, I chose that particular one for the color. It's just very unique. Yes, it is. All right, and then I'm gonna choose another flower. It's a short one. It's right here, the short balloon flower. Yes. And you know, they are the prettiest flower and many people have the tall ones. But this one literally is like a little balloon and you can just almost sit and watch there's, there's one right there ready to pop. They just open just like that. It is, um, and that one I've had for several years and it has stayed about that size. Yes, it does. And as long as I deadhead it, yep. um, it just keeps producing. It does. And at the end of this beautiful row, I can't help but note how vivid and bright your tall summer flock is there. Yes. It is, it is tall, and so I try to put it at the back of the garden. Um, it's in, uh, you'll find it in just about every bed of this garden. Butterflies love it. It can, it can do well as a cut flower in bouquets. Absolutely. Uh, I do have to work hard to keep it under control and keep it from spreading all over the garden. Well, and you know, that's a good thing too. But I do note that this one seems to not have the powdery mildew. No. And it's because the shiny leaf surface is a different, um, I don't know, but I have a native one that's like that, that um, the butterflies really love. And this is just a, a beautiful collection of color and variety that's in this quadrant of your garden. Well, thank you. Tell me, two plants that maybe you couldn't live without, what would they be? Well, definitely the daylilies. Um, this time of year, this big orange um, is kind of the king of the garden. It uh, is. When you, when you walk into the garden, your eyes are immediately drawn to it. Um, it doesn't need a lot of deadheading. As I've collected, um, the lilies, you, you, we were talked about planning to fail and, and failing to plan. Some of the trial and error has been labeling them by their official names. I started out carefully labeling all of them with a, a Sharpie and then realized a year later, it's gone. it was gone. So um, you know, everybody wants a, a division, a clump of some of my day lilies. And so I've taken to just calling this one Big Orange. <laughs> Every garden needs some white in it to give it some pop. Exactly. Um, these make beautiful cut flowers for bouquets. And just look at the number, the amount of, of blooms. And it has an extended bloom time. When I purchase, I'm always looking for extended bloom time and rebloomers. Right. This so, does rebloom? Yes, it does. Okay. And you know, the bud count. Also, I like the height of the bloomscape, too. Mm -hmm. It's not intrusive. That's right. It's, it is shorter. So I concur with you. I, I, would, I would definitely say I would choose these two. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, what a pleasure it has been to walk your garden and see what you laid out and how you've accomplished your goals. It's fabulous, and I'd say you would be a five-star garden. Thank you. And um, thank you for allowing us to walk your paths and pick your mind and see what you've done here. I've enjoyed your visit. Thank you. thank you. If you like gardening, you'll want to subscribe to this channel. We showcase gardeners, plants, and the joy that growing can bring.